So I was sharing with Jeff that my mother called just uh, about an hour before this call to let me know that I'm being inducted into my high school hall of fame. So she was incredibly proud about that and, you know, just thought I should probably, you know, feel as if my life's work is done at this point. So that, that is, that is the latest um, hat to hang on my, my coat tree, I guess. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So Angela, can you, before we, before we kind of go into more question and answer, I would love to just start with who you are, what you do, and how, what, what your mission is with all, with all of these talks, because in more, yeah. in all seriousness, you've given TED talks on this subject, you've done a whole bunch of, of work in this area. Yeah, no, thanks. So I'm a pediatrician. Um, I live here in Minneapolis and um, I think I would say I am a pediatrician. I'm a parent. Um, I am an LGBTQ person. I identify as queer and gender nonconforming. I tend to identify somewhere as non-binary. Um, and I have been advocating for LGBTQ health issues ever since I was in medical school. And I think the thing that draws me to doing this work is that my experience has been that often people fear the things they don't understand. And that if you can help people understand things that are unfamiliar or foreign to them, they often are much more embracing of people and concepts than you know, one might otherwise imagine. And I love working in healthcare because at the end of the day, everyone who's in healthcare, I think really ultimately wants to keep people safe in my line of work, keep kids safe. And I think I can make a really compelling argument around work that we have to do with LGBTQ youth and really sometimes easy ways that we can change our behavior to keep them safe. Um, and I, I love being able to open hearts and minds and make that kind of real tangible change happen. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that's kind of what gets me out of bed in the morning, so. So before we plunge into um, the actual work of keeping LGBTQ youth safe and, and what that even means, I'd love to kind of unwind and, and really move into that, a little bit of that understanding phase and, and kind of look a little bit at the understanding phase. I think for a lot of people, certainly who've come through the academy, a lot of the language, even just like the baseline language is yeah. baffling, right? How do, we, how do we talk about these sort of emerging yeah. trends um, and, and so on? Can you give us like a glossary of terms? Um, <laughs> can you give us like some of the key important terms and the understanding yeah. that we need to have or the, the underlying kind of concepts that sit underneath them for us to yeah. even have that conversation more effectively. Yeah, yeah, I'm used to you know using some visuals, so I'll try to do this without visuals. But um, I think that the three biggest concepts to understand when it comes to gender in particular are the differences between sex, gender, and gender expression. So sex, or the words that I use are assigned sex at birth, is based on anatomy, and that is something that is externally assigned to us when we are born. So all of us come into the world, and you know, for those of us who are, you know, 35 years of age and older, usually what happened is we were born. Someone looked at our genitals, they made an assumption: this is a boy, this is a girl, and um, so be it. The end. For people who were um, born who are younger than that, they probably also had an ultrasound prenatally and maybe some chromosomes checked and other things that were sort of anatomic or biologic markers of being male or female. So <clears throat> sex, sex really refers to that, that kind of sex assigned at birth, um, which I like to say is kind of our, our best guess from the outside in of who someone might grow up to be. Um, gender is how you see yourself. So regardless of that external assignment that was given to you when you were born, when you think about who you are and when you think about how you move in the world and how you show up in the world, how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as male, female, something in between? 
Um, and so that's a self-identification. No one can tell you what your gender identity is other than you. So someone can tell you what your sex assigned at birth was or what your biological chromosomes are, but no one can tell you your gender identity. That's up to you. Um, and then gender expression is everything that's on the outside of you, haircut, clothes you wear, uh, the name you use, the pronouns you use, do you wear makeup, do you not, what activities do you engage in? And while I like to teach my kids that clothes are for everyone and toys are for everyone, the reality is that when we go into Target, it doesn't say clothes when we go to the clothes section. It says boys clothes and girls clothes. So the reality is that everything literally in our society down to laundry soap at this point is gendered um, into masculine and feminine. So gender expression is how you show yourself to the world and then is it masculine or feminine or where is it on that spectrum? And sometimes those three things line up. So sometimes you're assigned female at birth you identify as a girl and you appreciate and express femininity. Then you sail through. Sometimes you're identified as male, you or you're you're assigned male at birth, you identify as male, and you really appreciate and embrace masculinity. Great. Um, but for many people, they may be assigned male or female at birth, um, feel that that fits for them, but really don't like to be feminine or masculine and like to explore that expression. For a smaller percentage of people, they are assigned male or female at birth, but when it comes to identity, that does not fit for them. And so those people would identify as transgender or gender diverse. Um, and then there's an even smaller subset of people who are intersex, who when they are born, their anatomy is not readily distinguishable as male or female. And so then they're categorized as intersex when they're born. So those that might be kind of a helpful base to build off of language. There are so many different terms to describe gender identity um, that I probably can't go through and define them all, but I can certainly send a glossary of terms for people to look at, you know, after the fact. Thank you. That's super, super duper helpful. Um, with, with language, have you seen a growth, number one, in so the growth of the language, has that grown our understanding and our optionality? number one, and number two, has it kind of grown freedom? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the world is changing, which, you know, all of us experience as we age, we watch the world change around us, but the world of gender in particular and gender identity and expression is absolutely changing. There's a gender revolution going on right now with, I would say, anyone under the age of 25. So the way that people are conceiving this generation Z and younger, the way that they are conceiving of gender identity is totally different than the way many of us did. So when I was a kid and I grew up, there were boys and girls, the end. Boys married girls, girls married boys, the end. I maybe heard of a gay person, you know, not really. Um, that was it. No one talked about it ever. Um, there were still plenty of people who are LGBTQ. We just never talked about it. And now this um, sort of spectrum of gender identity is, these are words that most kids know. Um, being asked what pronoun you use is pretty much just the commonplace thing in any high school when you join any class or any extracurricular activity. So the concept that gender is something you self-determine that's not assigned to you um, is pretty well-rooted in anyone who's Generation Z or younger. That's a harder concept for people who are older because we were taught that that sex assigned at birth was your gender identity. Like you didn't get a choice in that. That was just sort of who you were. Um, so, so there is a significant shift and change with that. As you, um, as you work together as an advocate with, with these kids and their parents are kind of bringing them through or maybe their grandparents or whatever, what are the kind of the language blunders or the kind of conceptual blunders that you're seeing them making that they could avoid? What are the things that, you know, as someone in their fifties, yeah. which, which I am, um, yeah. what, how might I sort of avoid some of those obvious holes to fall into? Or what are the obvious yeah. holes to fall into? Um, I think the, the biggest hole is, is um, you know, misgendering someone. So calling someone the wrong um, pronoun. So referring to someone with 
he or she pronouns that doesn't match up for them. And the biggest way to avoid that is to ask everybody their pronouns. So the easiest way to ask someone their pronouns is to share your own. So if you say, hi, my name's Jeff, I use he, him pronouns. What's your name and what pronouns do you use? Then you're one saying, yeah, this is a normal thing for people to share pronouns because I'm gonna just go ahead and share mine, which if you're a cisgender person, meaning that the sex you were assigned at birth is the same as your gender identity, you carry a lot of privilege with that. So leading with your pronouns is a really nice welcoming way to invite others to do the same. Um, but even if you don't introduce yourself with your pronouns, you may just say, you know, hi, Jeff, it's nice to meet you. What pronouns do you use? And then you'll tell me, oh, I use he, him, and then great. And then I won't mistake it. The thing that gets really hard there, and I don't want to put a generational blunder on this. I just want to put a human blunder on this. The thing that gets hard there is bias. So we've all probably learned a ton about bias, whether it's with race or gender or whatever the, the case is. But um, bias exists so that our brains don't have to make a thousand decisions a day. So we learn to categorize and stereotype things from a very young age to help us make it through our day. I don't mm. think about when I pull up to a stoplight, if it's actually red or green, I just know that wherever the light turns on, that's the signal I'm going to follow. It could turn purple and I'd still do the thing that I know I'm supposed to do. Um, and so it's the same way with gender. So it gets hard when someone tells us, so if I were to meet you, Jeff, and I said, Jeff, what are your pronouns? And you said, oh, my pronouns are they, them. And I'm hearing your voice and it's deep and it's masculine and I'm seeing your face and you have facial hair. My brain is constantly telling me he, 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 he. So I have to like, it's like a wheelbarrow in a rut. Like I've got to like lift the wheelbarrow out of the rut and kind of force myself to say they when I'm saying Jeff instead of saying he, if that is your personal pronoun. Um, and so we misgender people all the time, not on purpose, but just because our brains are kind of um, trying to make us fall into old patterns. And I think the biggest mistake people would do there is, is not acknowledging that. So if you use someone's wrong pronouns, just to say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, oh, I'm sorry, Jeff, I said he, I meant they, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I'm gonna keep working on that and just kind of moving on. Um, don't expect absolution from the person who you just misgendered. They shouldn't have to make you feel better about that, but just acknowledging it instead of ignoring it, I think is really helpful. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is, I would never expect, this is what I do for work, is, you know, explore gender. I would never expect anyone who doesn't to keep up with the myriad of terms there are to describe gender identity. And even with the work I do, I had a 17 year old yesterday in clinic who when I um, asked her what, how she identified her gender, she said, I identify as a demigirl. Hmm. Now I can go online and look up what the definition of demigirl is, but that does not give me any indication of whether that is how this 17 year old is using that term. So what I usually say then is, well, that's interesting. Tell me what that means to you. So then she'll tell me what it means to her. And I'm not saying like, oh, what's a demigirl? Because one, uh, then she'll think I'm dumb. Um, and, and two, uh, it can sound kind of dismissive. So I'm saying like, oh, that's great thing. You know, thanks for sharing with me that you're a demigirl. What does that mean to you? So I'm trying to get to know her better and kind of exploring that definition a little bit more, or even the term non-binary, which is a very common used term or gender fluid with kids. I have a pretty good conception of what that may or may not mean, but even non-binary means different things to different people. Some people say non-binary means both male and female. Some people say non-binary means neither male or female. So I think the other sort of nice thing to do is if someone shares their identity with you to say, you know, thank you for sharing that. Can you tell me more about that, what that means to you? And just hearing and learning a little bit more rather than making an assumption. Mm. Um, and then finally the last blunder, and I guess I don't think about this as much because I work with kids and not adults, but y'all are adults. Please don't ever ask a transgender person what medication and or surgery they have or have not taken or had. Um, that is a very common thing that happens to transgender people in the world. They get asked a lot about their bodies and it's just not something we ever do to each other. You know, I don't ask people what surgeries they've had. I don't ask people what medications they're taking. Um, and it feels pretty invasive to transgender people to ask that, but cisgender people often feel empowered to ask that because they're trying to place them in the category of, are you a real woman, man, whatever the case may be. Um, which that's not ours to say anyway. Um, so that's just kind of a, you know, baseline pro tip. Don't ask trans people if they've had 
the surgery or a surgery or those kinds of questions. I think just being curious and open is probably your best, your best bet. Cool. So avoid misgendering by introducing yourself with, with your own pronouns and using that as an opening. Um, can you, and should you do that in your email, in your communications as well? Absolutely, great yeah. idea. So I just did a board consultation um, last night with the Project Glimmer board and, um, you know, I talked to them about how when I went on their board page, for example, to read about all the board members, I, I couldn't see anyone's pronouns. Um, and so I said, you know, one way to demonstrate inclusivity is when, you know, make sure that all of your board members have their pronouns on the page and, you know, use the pronouns in your email signature. And those are just really sort of low hanging fruit ways to communicate inclusivity to trans and gender diverse folks. And really, I think LGBTQ folks in general, they, they'll see that and know that you're someone who's sort of mindful of of the community. Mm -hmm. and, and within that misgendering is whatever sex you see, you got to get out of the rut of making any assumptions and, and clarify with the person you're talking to, right? Yeah, yeah, whatever the phenotypic, that's our medical word, whatever the phenotypic characteristics are of a person that signals in your brain, whether they might be male or female, we have to sort of undo that. Um, to help people feel more comfortable. Yeah, I love this pro tip of tell me what that means to you. <laughs> yeah, it's just, that's, that's awesome. Cool. That's awesome if you have kids, just as a like, if, if especially teenagers, I mean, teenagers, their whole job is to just shock us. Like they just wanna like basically yeah. make our jaws drop all the time. So if they tell you anything that kind of, that's what you wanna do, a nice, retort back is tell me more about that or tell me what that means to you or tell me what you think about that because mm -hmm. you know they're trying to get the rise out of us all the time so and then the, the third one is is actually and it seems like a just a great life rule which is if someone is different in any way don't feel like you can ask them questions that wouldn't be polite in any other scenario right, right. yeah it's about trust building you know when I um so with my friends who are black, for example, you know, they're always saying, don't touch my hair, you know, like just don't touch my hair. That's not a cool thing. If you're friends with me and we know each other and we've built trust and you want to ask me about my hair, that's fine. But mm -hmm. if we just are meeting each other for the first time, like I don't want you touching or talking to me about my hair. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of along those lines. Like if you have trust in a relationship with someone and you're asking inquisitive questions, that's one thing. But just upon first meeting or casual acquaintance, probably not great. Yeah, don't go there. Yeah. Okay, so for a lot of us, this is gonna appear in our lives with our children or our grandchildren or colleagues or, or whatever. Yeah, um, nieces, nephews, neighbors, yeah. yeah. I have an eight-year-old and as a parent, I'm sort of going through kind of agonies of how do I frame this to, to my to my eight-year-old son? I don't want to say anything that will limit his options or indeed my, my, my six-year-old daughter's options, but I don't want to be confusing either, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so what is, as, as a parent, what are the best ways to approach this? Yeah, I think there's different ways. I have kids too. I have two seven-year-olds and a five-year-old. Um, so, you know, from the time that our kids were little, uh, we kind of expanded gender for them a little bit out of the box. So we said, you know, when we were teaching them about body parts, and this just came up, my seven-year-old just asked me about this again in the shower last night. Um, you know, most boys have penises, most girls have vaginas. Um, not all, most. So that they kind of left open the possibility for them that, you know, anatomy isn't destiny and that there are people who have different anatomy or biology than them that may identify as boys or girls. And that that's true for them too. Um, we talk a lot about the world. So that's a really good way. You know, kids listen for cues all the time. So um, like, I'll never forget being a 19 year old and I had not yet come out as gay to my one of my aunts. And she was in a department store with my mom and they were having a conversation about the TV show, Will and Grace. And my aunt was saying how she thought it was so horrible that Will and Grace was on during quote unquote prime time where kids could watch it. Um, now, if any of you have seen Will and Grace, like mildest show on the planet, <laughs> no, nothing scandalous for kids. 
but there were gay characters and she thought that was inappropriate. So um, even though I'm close with this aunt now, relatively, um, that comment has stuck with me. I'm 43 all these years. Um, so, so kids are like little sponges, you know, and they absorb all that stuff. So I think that there's always opportunities to just talk about the world. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Well, you know, what do you think about the color pink? Do you think that that's just for girls or boys or for anybody? You know, what do you think about these toys? Or why do you think that these toys are in this aisle and those toys are in that aisle? Do you think it means that only some kids can play with some or others? Or can any of the kids play with any of the toys who are in the store? So I think just opening up really inquisitive conversations and then sharing your values through that. Like, well, I think that dresses are for everybody. And I think that anyone can wear dresses. And in our family, it's okay for boys to play with dolls or girls to love sports or whatever it is. Um, and last night, the question my seven-year-old asked me was, um, he said, why do boys have penises and why do girls have vaginas? As he's getting out of the shower, because you know, that's the best time to ask these questions about body parts. And I said, well, you know, Sam, remember, most boys have penises and most girls have vaginas. And I said, that's just how, you know, most girls are made that way and most boys are made that way. And then he said to me, well, how do I know if I'm a boy then? And I said, well, what does your brain tell you? Does your brain tell you that you're a boy? Or does your brain tell you that you're a girl? Or is your brain not sure? And he said, well, my brain tells me that I'm a boy. And I said, well, then you're a boy. You're whatever your brain tells you. So I think sometimes it's just, you know, taking those opportunities when kids ask questions. We get really scared when kids ask questions. Kids ask me all the time if I'm a boy or a girl. And I love it when they do because it tells me that they're thinking about it. You know, I don't want them to feel ashamed for asking me if I'm a boy or a girl. It's an opportunity, you know, to have a conversation. Um, George Floyd was murdered in my city and there were protests and riots and, you know, wooden planks up on the stores just blocks from my house. And that was a great opportunity for me to have conversations with my kids about race and about racism and about police violence. And, you know, well, why were people burning buildings and why would the police do that to somebody? And, you know, why didn't they just, you know, ask him if the money was real? I mean, they had all kinds of questions and they're really hard, uncomfortable conversations. Um, but we have to be willing to like kind of be uncomfortable with our kids to one, share our values with them, but also to help them learn about the world. So that's a really long answer to your question, Jeff. But I think just, you know, being expansive in our language and being open about both asking questions to kids and listening and answering their questions honestly, I think is a good step. Um, kids ask where babies come from all the time. My kids ask that, lots of kids ask that. So we talk about that in terms of body parts, not like women give birth to babies, but like people who have a uterus in their body give birth to babies. So like, it just, it just kind of expands things a little bit so that they don't get so stuck on this like sex gender expression, like they all line up, you know? They might, they might not. Right. And my kids are all very sort of masculine cisgender boys at this point. So I can guarantee you that having these conversations doesn't like make kids transgender or make kids gay or just in case anyone's worried about that. Yeah. I, I came from two very heterosexual cisgender parents and here I sit in front of you, gay as the day is long wearing a bow tie, so. Just how it happens. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I hate to tell you, but yes. <laughs> um, no, actually, far from it. My my concern was more that I didn't want to put my kind of cisgender normie Jeff thing all over it and ruin it for them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna cisgendery Jeff. Yeah, I like that. I'm gonna go with that. Yeah. Um, so as kids get older. Um, and I don't know how much older, maybe you can you can share with us, what is the age where kids move from just asking interesting questions to saying, hey, I, I think I'm, you know, I'm assigned incorrectly and I want to make changes. Yeah. Um, what do we do as parents? What do we do as friends? Yeah. What do we do as counselors when, when that starts to happen? And when does that start to happen? It, it can happen at any age. Um, gender identity forms as young as three and four years old. And for most of us who are cisgender, that is when our gender identity formed. And so if I asked everyone on this call, when did you first know that you were a boy or a girl? You probably can't remember. And you probably can't remember because you don't remember anything from the time that you were three or four years old. And it just is like, well, it's just how I've always been. 
Um, so some kids as young as three and four years old, they, they know what boys and girls are, they understand the categories, they understand the bodies, and they also understand that they don't fit. And so some kids, when given the language and opportunity, are sharing that with their parents that young. For other kids, it might take some time, um, either because of the setting that they're in or they don't have access to the words or language. A common story I get from adolescents who come out as teenagers is that I always felt like something wasn't right and something didn't fit, but I didn't know how to talk about it. And then I learned about what transgender meant or what transgender people are. And then I finally had some words for that. I learned what being non-binary was. Um, and so it can really happen at any age. I mean, until recently, people didn't come out as being transgender until they were adults. I mean, often in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, and then attempting transition at that age. Um, you know, Caitlyn Jenner and other sort of famous transgender uh, mm -hmm. folks. Um, and so, you know, it can really happen at any age. And I think the, the best thing, you know, when someone comes out to you, whether it's about being trans or being gay, I, my best advice about coming out is to match energy. So if someone's really scared and they're kind of crying and they're really nervous, then you need to match that energy with comfort. Mm. So like give them the energy back that they need. If someone is like, you know, hey, I just wanted you to know I'm gay or hey, by the way, I'm trans then match that energy. Like, oh, that's interesting. Thanks for telling me. I'd love to hear more. Should we talk about it now or later? Like, you know, and then if someone is like, hey, great news, you know, I figured out that I'm trans, then you can say like, that's really cool. Let's, let's talk more about that. I'd love to hear where that came, you know? So I think what, what's, what's hard is when we don't match energy. So like when we make a big deal as parents about something that kids are keeping small, then that builds more anxiety. So I think kind of matching energy is helpful. And then I think trying to support without steering, asking a lot of questions, um, finding out what they need from us, letting them know that this is a journey that they're on and that we're there to support them. We're there to ask questions. We're there to get them information. Um, they can change their mind that's a really important thing. I mean, a lot of kids I think are, they hold it in for so long because they're worried, what if they're wrong? Like, I think I might be trans, but what if I'm not? And I wish that they would just tell their parents, yeah, I think I might be transgender, but what if I'm not? And then parents could say, well, if you're not, that's fine. And if you are, that's fine. So, you know, tell me what feels right right now. And then we'll kind of go with it as, as it goes, you know? Mm -hmm. um, we don't have to, you know, make a stake in the ground that lasts forever. You know, those decisions come when we start to do medical treatments, which are really in late adolescence. And so, you know, anything that's kind of may have some permanent effects isn't until um, later in adolescence and early adulthood. And so particularly for younger kids, we have time to sort through it. In, um, in our preparatory conversation, you talked about this idea of having multiple identities in a lifetime and the need for patience because of that. Can you, can you just explore that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think for those of us who are in our you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, if you look back on your life, you probably, um, probably not with your gender identity, though maybe, um, but with other identities, certainly, I think have moved in and out of things that feel more or less like you in a lifetime. And I think particularly with adolescents, it's really important to remember that that expression piece, this sort of expressing on the outside who I am on the inside is a very fluid process. Teenagers are, their whole developmental goal is finding out who they are. So, you know, letting kids sort of have the freedom to do that and maybe as an elder, giving them some wisdom that identity formation is sort of a lifelong process. Um, gender identity tends to be somewhat fixed once people settle on it. But I think particularly for kids who are in the in-betweens, I had a kid call me tell me the other day that they were an in-betweener. I said, what's your gender identity? And they said, I'm an in-betweener. I thought that was great. Um, Self-proclaimed self identity. You know, so if, especially for kids who are kind of figuring it out, just to let them know that like that ambiguity is fine. You know, that being in an ambiguous place is okay. And you have time to sort through that. And that if you feel really strongly right now about who you are, 
that may change and that that's also okay. And sometimes what changes our identity is that the world changes and we get different language. So I might identify as non-binary now at 43. I did not identify that way when I was 19 because that word didn't even exist yet. So, you know, I was identifying as butch or whatever other word there was at that time when I was coming out for my sort of gender expression. But our identities will shift as language shifts too. Um, and sometimes I think being an older person who has seen the world change, it's sometimes helpful to give that wisdom to the younger generation to say, these words didn't even exist when I was your age. So I can guarantee that there'll be more or different or other identities by the time that you are my age. You know, the only thing we can count on is change. Change is like our one steadfast uh, thing that we know. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna close off the sort of the interview part of this. Angela, I, you really have to come back down to Baja because I want to spend forever with you. Um, you're just fascinating and wonderful. Um, I want to just open it up to questions, observations. I know we've got a couple of people here in the, in the audience at the Academy as well that might want to ask some questions. Um, so you can either post them in the chat or raise your hand. Or just raise your hand or just observations. Yes. Yeah, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, uh, Angela, so much. Thanks so much for this and the work you're doing. It's, it's, um, it's uh, inspiring and important. Um, I've got a question at, at, a, um, at, a, at a bit more of a societal level. Um, as opposed to, to, I guess, at the personal level. And I'm thinking about the context of business and, and brands and um, whether you would have any advice for uh, people who are starting a business, you know, and likely are in our, our age bracket, but are starting a business or creating a brand and want to be inclusive from the start. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really hard to get information beyond just say the usual legal or even 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 HR right I think is struggling with this at the moment so it, it might be too big a question but I'm just really interested in your thoughts about how how as a business or a brand creator mm -hmm. can you carry this work you know in, into what you're doing yeah oh I think it's a great question actually and and one that I get asked a lot um, and I I've, I've done some consulting with different businesses and nonprofits who are asking the same question and I think the biggest thing to think about is that words matter and images matter and intention matters. So if you have an intention to be inclusive, you will likely end up on the other side being more inclusive than if you don't. So I think just thinking intentionally about, okay, you know, this logo, this, this wording that we're using, the images that we're putting on our, on our product, on our website, on whatever, um, who are they communicating that we're welcoming? Um, and, it, and sometimes the signals are subtle, you know, um, who the people are that are reflected, reflected back in advertising. Um, how, you know, like I mentioned that board of directors page that I was on for Project Glimmer, you know, it says nothing about what their mission is, but even if I see the pronouns they're listed for the board of directors, I know that inclusivity around gender is one of the things that's important to that organization, even if they never say it in their mission statement. I know it because I see the pronouns. Um, so I think just thinking through, you know, that, and then I think, uh, asking people, so I'm, you know, I'm a pediatrician and a large portion of the kids that I serve are not white and don't speak English as a first language. And I can't know what that, those communities need unless I ask them. And we as a hospital system also don't know how our brand hits them unless we ask them. So I think sometimes just maybe finding a few people who you um, trust that you could reflect some things off of to say, how does this hit you? Does this feel inclusive? What could I, what could I do more um, is helpful. Fantastic, thank you. Jen, Jen Mayer. Unmuting. Hi, Angela, thank you so much. Um, yeah. I'm just really curious about you. You mentioned that you asked the girl, uh, "What does demi girl mean to you?" Mm -hmm. I'm dying to know the answer. 
Oh, sure. So what she said was that Demi girl meant to her, like, I'm not all the way female, but I'm definitely not male. So I'm like some version of female was what she told me. Like, okay. I don't know if I'm a girl, but I know I'm not a boy. That's what she told me. That's awesome. I might so, have to take that on. Yeah. <laughs> so. We have people here in the room. Does anyone have questions as well? I want to make sure. Um, Mark, we had a lunch and an interesting conversation about how you talk to your children about sexuality. Is there anything, anything there you want to explore? Um, yeah, I'm happy to share what we talked about. Um, it was more around, uh, my wife and I have talked about uh, the fact that these days it's not necessary to come out because mm -hmm. say mom and dad, I'm straight. Um, but in that case, when you have kids and they're starting to get into relationships, what's the conversation that you could have around their sexual orientation without them, as you say, or offending them, which is more likely just because you're a parent? <laughs> we already did that. I was able to hear about 50% of it. Do you want to rephrase it for me, Jeff? Yeah, as I understood <laughs> it is, given that now most I mean, if, if, if you're a straight couple or if you're straight, you don't have yeah. to announce that to anyone. Right, right, right. Why would your kids have to announce to you that yeah. you're, you know, whatever, whatever choices yeah. they've made. So how do you have that conversation in that, if you're trying to yeah. foster yeah, yeah. Them, that this isn't something I'm trying to find out from you in just the same way that I wouldn't, you know. Right, right. No, that's a great question. and. And I think that's right. Um, I actually just on, just on the radio as I was driving this morning, um, they were talking about the football player who just came out in the NFL. And the commentator was talking about this, introducing this term of inviting in instead of coming out. Mm. Um, and that, you know, the burden shouldn't be on gay people to come out. That implies that gay people have to do something to share their identity with others. The burden should be on people who are not gay or who are cis or are not transgender to invite in to sort of invite the conversation or or you know to be invited in by lgbtq people into their identities and i thought that was kind of an interesting framing but um, the truth is that 15% of generation z identifies as lgbtq and of those 15% 25% of those use um, they them pronouns use non binary pronouns so a large portion of our young people are identifying as part of the LGBTQ community and exploring gender identity and expression. So I think rather than, you know, having this kind of coming out in the way that we traditionally thought about it, I think just keeping open-ended questions about relationships um, that are age appropriate. So with teenagers, you know, very much like, hey, I, you know, are you dating anybody? You know, I, I noticed you hanging out with this person a lot. Is that someone you're dating? You know, whatever, having that conversation. And then just kind of closing with, you know, hey, I hope you know that whoever you love, you know, whoever you're interested in, whoever you have crushes on, you know, we're just excited for you to be happy. You know, male, female, you know, in between, great with us. I think um, despite the fact that 15% of Generation Z identifies as LGBTQ, 80% uh, of those kids are still harassed in school and only a third of them feel that their homes are welcoming. So there is still a good reason to be intentional about your values with your kids. So there is still a good reason to say, hey, you know, mom and I or whatever, you know, we're, we're really just happy when you're happy. So whoever you end up falling in love with or dating is, is cool with us and just want to let you know that. Um, my kids are seven, they're starting to explore crushes. So our conversations go something like, is there anyone that you have a crush on, a boy or a girl? You know, no, not really. Okay, well, if you ever have crushes on anyone, boys or girls, you can talk to us about it. Okay, you know, like, and just, he just them hearing me say that, you know, and both of my seven-year-olds have crushes on girls, which I find hilarious. I don't ever remember having crushes at age seven, but probably I did. Um, but just them hearing me say boys or girls, they know then when they're 14, if they do have a crush on a boy, that it's going to be okay to tell me because they said it when they were seven. So they've kind of like known. Um, and kids pick up on that. When I talk to kids about their families, they'll say, yeah, I know my parents are okay with it. They've always told me. And so, you know, 
they'll they'll hear it. Um, can you Wednesday. can you hit those data points again, Angela? It was fifteen percent. Fifteen percent of Generation Z identifies as LGBTQ. Twenty five percent of those use gender neutral pronouns. Eighty percent of LGBTQ kids are harassed in school. A third of LGBTQ kids describe their homes as welcoming of their identity. One third. I am, I am filled with statistics. So, and I have a brain like a steel trap. So if you wanna know any numbers about anything having to do with LGBTQ kids, just ask me. Here's one that's really important for everyone on this call. Having one supportive adult in an LGBTQ person's life, one, doesn't have to be a parent, decreases their suicidality risk by 40%, almost half by having one supportive adult. Trans kids are nine times more likely to take their lives. LGBT, LGB kids are three to four times more likely. The suicide rates are really high. Sorry, so just say having kids. trans kids are nine times more likely to commit suicide. 41 to 50% of transgender kids will attempt suicide. Um, and LGB kids are three to four times more likely. But if they have one supportive adult in their life, it reduces their suicidality by 40%. So everyone on this call can be that one supportive adult which is the awesome thing about it because it doesn't have to be a parent or someone that you can't budge. It can be you, which is wow. great news. Wow, wow, wow. Um, I can just see that everyone here is like, okay, there's so much to this. We've got a couple of quick questions. Yeah. Um, Jean was asking, so rather than talking okay. to people, um, yeah. As they're, as they're transitioning or as they're exploring their sexuality, how do we communicate with other people? Those, the 77% of homes that yeah. aren't, um, you know, welcoming. welcoming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's tough. I mean, uh, you know, so I'll, I'll use my dad as an example. You know, he is just kind of set in his ways and, and hard to, to move on some things. And, um, I think one thing that is helpful is to use comparative examples. So um, if, if someone says, well, there's just boys and girls and that's it, you know, um, we know that's not true. I mean, we know that there's a spectrum of gender identity that's always existed. We just didn't, didn't have a lot of words for it. But if you look back in history, there's a wealth of transgender history that existed before us. So I think just saying, well, one thing that I've learned is X, Y, Z. Um, I always like you know, centering conversations on myself rather than saying you're wrong. Um, so one thing that I've learned is X, Y, Z. Um, another thing is, you know, this is a really good example that I heard that, you know, a small percentage of people are, or a smaller percentage of people are left-handed and some people are right-handed. Can left-handed people be told to write with their right hand? Yes, mm -hmm. they can, absolutely. Will they ever feel as comfortable or as natural writing with their right hand as they will their left? Probably never. So why wouldn't we just let left-handed people write with their left hand? So if someone feels inside that they are male or female, could we make them present as the gender, they, the sex they were assigned at birth? We can, we can totally do that. They might not survive, A, and they'll probably never be able to be their full selves. So why wouldn't we just let people be themselves because that's how we get to experience the full spectrum of their humanity. I mean, that's how we get the best of them. Mm. So what is it, what does it cost anyone to let everyone be themselves? You know, it doesn't, it doesn't cost me anything to let my kids follow their passions, um, even if they're, if they're not mine. And, you know, I think just kind of recognizing that your your experience that you have as a cisgender person isn't universal for everybody. You know, just like I'm right-handed and I have a left-handed son and I don't know what it's like for him being left-handed because that wasn't my experience growing up, but I would never force him to do it my way because it's what feels best for me. This could go on. We're already over time, but it's so rich and I really, really appreciate your time, Angela. A couple of sort of closing thoughts. Paul Loper is, is um, one of our most accomplished teachers. I want you to close us out and any thoughts that you have to share or questions you have. So 
let me prep you for that that's coming your way okay and uh, um you you're going to share with us some some reading lists some materials that we will post yeah. in the mea library as well as out to the community yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll send a couple of things. So I'm reading the, the chat here. Yeah. I'll send a reading list. Um, there's some great things to watch. Um, you know, definitely watch my TED talk. I think it's, yeah. I think it's worth it. Super accessible. Um, if you have Netflix, Disclosure is a great documentary. If you have Hulu, there's a show that just came out called Changing the Game about transgender athletes that I think is phenomenal. Um, I'll, but I'll send some lists of, of other things. And then for statistics, the Trevor Project is just a great organization to know. They're a suicide prevention organization for LGBTQ kids and they do an annual report. Their 2021 annual report just came out, includes some great information about LGBTQ kids and COVID and how they were impacted. Um, so they have great resources. And then the Human Rights Campaign also does youth reports, annual youth reports. And so they have great statistics as well. Um, and I will send to the gender language question, I have a handout about say this, not that. Um, so I'll send that, like, like we don't say transsexual, we say transgender, we don't say um, hermaphrodite, we say intersex, like, you know, some of these words that are sort of outdated. So um, I'll, uh, I'll send that along because that can be helpful. Paul, take us home. Hi, everybody. Um, all right. Well, um, first of all, let's all just uh, do some pearl polishing for Angela. <laughs> Thank you so much, Angela. Yeah. Um, and I'm just going to invite everybody to take a second. And if you feel comfortable closing your eyes, just sort of tune into your body. Notice your breath. Maybe take a couple of big breaths so that a little bit more is moving through, you've been sitting, taking stuff in and, and just allow yourself to track what you're feeling. Hmm. Putting the thoughts aside for a half a second. And if you were to name one or two of those feelings for yourself, just to identify at this moment, some feeling state that you're in. And from there, uh, without thinking about it, just what image comes to mind, like an image of a thing or a scene? And this is all very fast version, but let's close out by each person sharing that image. And that way we can hold each other as we move back out into our lives from this very exciting Zoom in a way that we get we get a lot of good hard data from Angela in the in the things she'll send us, but this can also hold us in some of our in our heart and our creative stances and our sense of connection with each other. It would be my hope. Um, so if that's uh, and if you want to pass, you can pass. Otherwise, just to speed this up because I guess we're over time. I'm going to call on people. Is that all right? It's beautiful, Mr. Loper. Um, I'm going to start with who's on the bottom of my screen, Colleen Hancock. Maybe some, so Jean Savell, Savell. Sorry, I was having a hard time unmuting. Uh, this Colleen. Um, I, my image is just a lots of different faces, all different colors of the rainbow. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Jean. My image is a massive old oak with hundreds of arms going in all directions. Mm, thank you. Barbara. Oh, we got two arms. My, 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 my apologies, Barbara Vance. I'm so sorry, my dog is barking at someone at the door. I feel like I can't talk right now. All right, well, thanks, Barbara. Mark Fuel. Hello. Um, Thank you. Uh, kids playing joyfully in the playground. Mm, thank you. Sally Durden. Um, I'm thinking of a, 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 an 11 year old transgender boy. I had the privilege of hearing speak with her um, very pro-Trump 
conservative father um, talking about their journey. And um, he made the point that I, he, he, uh, he said, at least my child is alive. And so he was totally accepting of her um, when she came out as a little girl and it just, um, it said it all to me. And she also made the point that her earliest conscious memory, um, his, sorry, excuse me, his earliest conscious memory um, was that she was a boy, as identifying as a boy. So anyway, I thank you for all the work you do. Thank you, Sally. Barbara Nelson. My conscious, or my uh, image was me standing uh, in a circle with all these question marks swirling around me. <laughs> Beautiful, thank you, Barbara. Uh, Betty Ann Baker. Um, I just had the feeling there's a concept in yoga about the Taji pole, which is sort of a beam of light that goes through your body. And that's really what I was feeling was the Taji pole. Mm, thank you. Jennifer Mayer. Uh, I have this image of a really hyper little bunny rabbit that was hopping all over my brain. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Catherine Coleman. I loved what Angela said about one person being able to make a difference. So I had an image of an adult with their arms around a child. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Don Landis. Uh, the um, accepting uh, cohort community sitting on that couch, making me wish I was back down in Baja. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my image was uh, dawn over a very beautiful lake. Leslie Bar Bartlett. I had this feeling of such connection and understanding. Um, and my image was a hug. Mm. I felt yeah. it. Jeff, what's your me yes. or Angela? Angela, what's your image? Let's go with you. Yeah, I um, my image was an ocean. I think partly because Don said that I should go back down to Baja, so I think I was thinking about the ocean. But I also just feel that you know, there's a sense of possibility that that for me the ocean represents um, something bigger than myself that I can't always understand, and that's sometimes how I feel about about gender and having these conversations. Um, everyone in the room peeled out except for this guy. So um, my, my image was of a festival, and just people coming together and, and enjoying each other and appreciating what was going on. Um, my image was, was pretty dark, actually. Um, well, not dark, but surprised me. I, I, when I was a kid growing up in Venezuela, um, there was a whole um, street of sex workers that were transgender. And my image was of them and kind of, it was a little heartbreaking really thinking of your statistics about how many of them likely would have been suicidal and so or on. Or killed. Yeah, or killed. I'm gonna give you one more. Yeah. Black, black transgender women are five times more likely to be murdered than we are. Oh, for so yeah, it's, it's a dangerous place for them. Sorry to end on a dark note, but that reminds me of that. Angela, you're such a wonderful educator. I love you. I'm so, so grateful that you're part of our community and thank yeah. you for spending this time with us.